open the session. Okay, good. Okay, Daniel, you open. I, who opens? Me? It's open. YouTube is open. Ah, YouTube, YouTube. Yes, YouTube. <laughs> Il est très fort. Laurent, je ne sais pas qui est Smog, si c'est moi ou quelqu'un d'autre. Jamais, jamais, Daniel, jamais. Non, mais c'est le bilanguage. Le bilanguage, tu sais, c'est le bilanguage. Il faut parler. Bilanguage. Vous êtes bien fait. You are. Bilanguage. Ok. Ah, Hugo. Bonjour, Hugo. So Daniel, YouTube is on. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we start the, the companion session. Is the staff meeting with discussion of the case, the actual case, and we start immediately. There was a, some difficult case presented last month, and uh, Daniel Cherki, Vivif. Uh, present the case, no, the, the, the issue, the issue no, the of the case uh, we discussed last week. Arrest me? No, no, uh, you ask me. I don't the, have, the old I don't one, have the no old one. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I, I have no, I have no slides on. on this one. I can go back to the previous slides, but uh, basically this was this patient with the advanced uh, cholangiocarcinoma uh, on uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis was uh, who received liver transplant and Whipple uh, on block and this was uh, he was trans he was transplanted uh, five weeks ago and uh, I showed you the pathology if you remember I don't know uh, so no basically he post op he was very good uh, he went home after four weeks because he had delayed because he couldn't eat for about uh, three weeks and all of a sudden went back so now it's good and we are contemplating uh, adjuvant treatment it's perfect mm. no, but Daniel, the decision was, was about the association of liver transplantation oui. and uh, and the uh, duodenopocratectomy yeah yeah whipple yeah sure uh -huh. you realize the the pancreatic anastomosis Yes, yes, we did the uh, pancreatic gastrostomy. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's Daniel. It's uh, I saw. I, I, I sorry, I couldn't see it live, but I watched it uh, a couple of weeks after on YouTube, and I really must congratulate you. It's fantastic you. Um, work. I did note that the uh, the tumor had a transverse diameter of three cm, as we mentioned, that probably puts it in criteria. Although longitudinally, it went right down to the pancreas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can, if you give me, a, if you want to see the slides again, I can, I can. Oh no, it's. I, I remember it was okay. uh, excellent. So it was, it was yeah. clearly, it was clearly out of criteria. Clearly, yeah. So I just wanted to ask you if, um, if uh, I mean, the main thing if we got it on block with an R naught, and was it an N zero operation? Do you think it was an N zero operation pre op? But on the specimen, there are two lymph nodes in the duodenum uh, uh, between the duodenum and the pancreas. Okay, no, so, no. so local to the pancreas, yeah. We're local to the pancreas. I did a lymphadenectomy uh, a week before the transplant, mm -hmm. and I, yeah. I did, and all the lymph, the uh, I mean the lymph nodes in the porta hepatis and the hepatic artery were were yeah. negative. Can I ask and a question? If you are on blood, that means that we never oh, dissected oh, the bile duct. Correct. So I'd just like to ask a question to the group. You know, we have many transplant surgeons who do not come from a hepatobiliary background. But here we are entering the realm of transplant oncology. This is really combining transplantation with oncology. And I understand in Europe, most of the tran liver transplant surgeons come from a very good head bill background, especially your school, Professor Bispeth, and everyone understands the oncology so they can combine those operations. But, um, you know, the advice of uh, what advice would we give a transplant surgeon trained in transplantation only? having to do an operation like this. It's a very different situation. John, it's probably because, unfortunately, as you know it, in UK, they followed uh, mostly the uh, 
uh, I would say the policy of the United States, when you say transplant surgeon, I personally saw many who come from a background of vascular surgeon and they, they created the concept of natural transplant surgeon, which does not exist in Europe. Uh -huh. Basically, uh, the school of Professor Bismuth and the school of European is to be specialized in an organ. If you are in liver, you have to be a liver surgeon, liver uh, cultural philosophy of the liver surgery, and then oncology and everything. Unfortunately, unfortunately in UK, it's not the case. So, so yeah. let me, you give your music. Then yet you have to answer. Well, no, I, I, uh, first of all, I think uh, uh, the, the concept of transplant surgery is, a, is an Anglo-Saxon concept that's true. And it's the case in the United States, like you have abdominal wow. transplant surgeons. They do uh, liver, liver, pancreas, and, and kidney. Uh, they usually come from a strong general surgery background. Wow. And... Uh, in, and if, especially if they do pancreatic transplant, they know uh, how to manage a pancreas. That doesn't mean that they know how to do a complex Whipple, especially uh, on blood with transplant. But they, they, I'm sure it's, so it's a different philosophy. But nowadays, uh, and this was, for example, Ron Busetil is a vascular surgeon. Yet yeah. the new generation, like the people like Jean Limon and others, are intertubular surgeons as well. So that, I'm talking about the United States. I don't know about the UK. Maybe, John, you want to answer about the UK. Yeah. Well, I, I can tell you, um, you know, Gina um, did mention that a lot of transplant surgeons uh, came from a non hep bill uh, background. But I'm happy to say that in liver transplant, that, that is changing. The, the vast majority now mm. come from a hepatobiliary background, uh, which is why, you know, we are, we are comfortable with this this growing, uh, you know, school of transplant oncology. As we we take on cholangios, we take on colorectal, and we take on neuroendocrine tumors. All transplant surgeons need to have an understanding of the oncology, and uh, and exactly the reason why you know the European school, um, I think, led the way on this, and and the rest are catching up, which is which is so, a great. Thing. So it's like the states. I, I think it's like the US. I, I have and a remark. Mm -hmm. no, sorry. No, I have a remark. Uh, uh, of course, I approve what you have seen. But, you know, uh, you did uh, liver transplant plus a ripple, which is an uh, important operation. And, uh, you know, uh, many years ago, I say now many years ago, uh, when there was this indication, and I have several cases of uh, uh, sturgeon cholangitis with cholangiocarcinoma. We know there was cholangiocarcinoma. But uh, we hesitate to associate a uh, resection of total biliary duct, which is which need, of course, a ripple operation. And in some cases, I did two step. And one of the objections was not the importance of expression, but also we are afraid to do a ripple operation with all the suture with steroids. At that time, we give steroids immediately after the operation, after the transplantation. No, we, still do. we are afraid. We are afraid about that. So the the, the the attitude recommended at that time was not to do the ripple operation at the same stage, but it could be one month after. And I think I did one one month after to wait. The, the, we, we go out of the immediate period postoperative of the, of the transplantation to decrease the steroid treatment and then to do the ripple operation. Apparently, this is no more the case. I continue my remark. I think there is an important uh, topic to discuss or to work what could be the extent of the transplantation to other, to other surgery. That means when you do a liver transplant, what could be the other association that you may do at the same time. Mm -hmm. You have the answer for the Whipple, I think, but it could be also a uh, talgastrectomy or colectomy, uh, or I, I don't know. Uh, I think well, this is the point. I don't read paper on this point. Uh, to, to say to treat extent, we may do other surgery associated to a liver transplantation during the mm -hmm. same surgery. Daniel, you, you want to say something? I, say, I have a couple. Of, number one, I, I, I'd like to uh, emphasize what John said about transplant oncology. I think this is a, a very important new concept, which is actually specific to liver transplant. 
There's no trans other organ transplantation yes, right. for cancer. You don't have lung transplant for cancer or anything oh. else. So this is very specific to liver transplantation. Number two, Whipple is special because in the Whipple, we do on block resection of the bile duct. So it's not a remote organ. It's, the, it's in the vicinity. And in case, I think that oncologically, it makes a lot of sense to do no touch operation. Uh, when it is when we talk from the Whipple, and in the case I presented the other day, it was not possible to do it two stage. So that that's the, the other thing. Some what some uh, there's another remark is that in Japan for high local for uh, peri high local angiocarcinoma is not transplant. They do is when they have to do Whipple, some teams just drain the, the pancreatic duct and do the the uh, the pancreatic the pancreatic anastomosis and the on the second stage as you said the second stage now coming back to the other organs i think we've all done uh, colectomies by necessity it happened to me that i, I had the huge colon that i had to remove uh, to just to close the patient or stuff like that or uh, because you had an injury to the colon in the difficult transplantation and this happened usually in, the, in such cases we usually do a, a double stoma. We do a iliocolostomy or something like that, but occasionally we may also. Do. But I think that oncologically, uh, the Whipple makes a lot of sense. And finally, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> finally, uh, go on, go on. this, this is, uh, the question is about indications going out of the box. And if I may, may I share? Uh, I don't know, it's, uh, it's not very scientific, but I'm going to show you something is it possible to show my screen yep uh, present now on the right hand side yes i do but i don't have the uh, i don't have the possibility someone has to give me possibility uh, okay. because I, I clicked on it and i can't daniel the webmaster yeah. we have a webmaster daniel yeah but uh, i uh, yeah, no, Daniel. not you, Daniel. Daniel, yeah, yeah, yeah. Daniel Kitayama. Kitayama. Daniel Kitayama is the chairman. Of yeah, as always, the Google Meet uh, does not require the meeting host. Yeah, but to, I'm, I'm, I'm checking, I'm, I'm clicking now. To <laughs> authorize the screen sharing. I suggest you try to try to rejoin the meeting. Unfortunately, I can't, I cannot uh, change the... I cannot outright. I have to, I have to, I have to go out and come back. Okay, bye bye. No, no, <laughs> you Laurence, <sorry. laughs> Laurence, you have to say something on this point, Laurence. You're muted, Laurence. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, I agree with Daniel. In fact, uh, uh, to my opinion, today, oncologically and technically, it's better to do the Whipple transplantation, the Whipple. Uh, in the time of the transplantation. It's quite easy, in fact, because you, res you resect in block, and uh, oncologically, it's better than a, a two-step uh, uh, operation. Uh, I, I performed uh, three or four uh, uh, combined uh, procedure, and the problem is not the operation itself. In fact, the danger is the pancreatic anastomosis. And uh, to my opinion, uh, I would recommend if uh, the surgeon begins this uh, procedure, this heavy procedure, to do uh, to not to do the anastomosis, because we know that uh, uh, the problem it is fistula, and there are a lot of an, a vascular anastomosis. So uh, uh, personally, uh, in for for the the indication of this operation we have always a uh, normal pancreatic. So the, the, the risk of fistula is quite high. So to my opinion, I do not perform the anastomosis and I reject a little more of the pancreas in order to drain the pancreas far from the vascular anastomosis. And, and to protect the anastomosis by a, a, a drainage, a ductal drainage. Yes, that's it. That's a, 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 a drainage, a, a simple drainage of the pancreas, and uh, preferably on the left. No, no. No, no, no. But to do the anastomosis and letting a tube inside ah, the pancreatic duct. It's yes. possible, but the risk of fistula is not zero, even with the, with the stent. So, to my opinion, not to perform the anastomosis can be uh, more reasonable. 
because the pancreas is is uh, normal, so the 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 fistula risk is high. May we discuss other opinion on this point? Uh, yeah. Laurent, even if you cover it with an ileostomy? What do you mean, uh, a jejunostomy, sorry, jejunostomy, you know, so that you don't uh, intervene because when you say that you have a higher risk of fistula, your fistula, does it happen very shortly after the transplant or lately? You know, the, 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 the pancreat fistula can happen very shortly, three, I four, know. five days, and the collection also. So it's very, very dangerous because of the vascular anastomosis very nearby this anastomosis. So I have this is the risk. Yeah. Of course, this is the risk. Uh, fortunately, it didn't have the loose hands of no, 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 the I want, I want to make it here. Uh, Oh, I, and I always need the pancreatic gastrostomy. Yes. Because I want to keep it away. Uh, yeah, and that's what I did the other day. And I did the Bachelier technique, which is, uh, I believe we may talk someday about it, which I believe is. Anyway, uh, basically, I did pancreatic gastrostomy, and out of the five, uh, one died of ruptured artery. So the risk is the, art, the rupture of the artery. That was many years ago. That was about 15 at Mondor, a long time ago. Everything was fine. It was very happy. And uh, it was a zollinger ellison syndrome with uh, liver metastasis. It was not a good indicator. Any, anyway, so the patient was fine. And he, when, he went out, when he went to the, the floor, he, he, we couldn't save him. But Daniel, that's, that's, the, that's the risk. That's the risk. That is the Daniel, you, you, Sorry. you said there is one death um, out, of out of four. Five. five. That's that's a lot. But 25, 25, <laughs> yeah, 25, I know, I know, I know. That, that's uh, but this recommend was the death was. Yeah, that's. I'm telling you what's ha what happened. You uh, know, uh, you for a know? pancreatic for a pancreatic surgeon, the real fear is that kind of a vascular yeah. complication. The day of bleeding. The day of bleeding. Of course, uh, and that and, is and terrible. And so that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago, and I think that with the with a good technique of pancreatic gastrostomy, I think the risk is limited. Uh, uh, Daniel, Daniel, I performed only pancreatic gastrostomy, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of, and uh, the risk exists. Of yes, course, sure. it's less. It's less dangerous than. Yeah. Uh, so Vaginostomy because they don't mix the bile. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but when it c occurs, uh, well, it's it's it can be very uh, dangerous also. Yes. Yeah. So, well, maybe uh, grade C fistula happen in uh, ten percent or fifteen percent of the cases. That's not a lot, but when it happens, well, it can be very. Uh, well, it potentially lateral. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Okay, I can't see what we have done. Please, 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 please. please. Uh, ask, I cannot ask, share my screen. No, ask, ask the, 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 first John, then Daniel. Okay. Okay. John. Since we're talking about combining oncology with transplantation, and if we look at what the oncological surgeons will do when they have a Whipple that needs a major vascular resection, especially an artery, they almost routinely will do a total pancreatectomy to solve the problem. Well, why, why don't we consider this in a transplant? I realize we'll have a difficult diabetic to control, but the consequences of a vascular uh, complication with the pancreas leak is so great. And you, you know, Loren, you said you go way to the left, a little bit more, and that's a total pancreatectomy, and there's no, no problem and no second operation. I, I agree, John, but uh, the diabetes is quite a problem, you know, and uh, remember that those patients were not diabetic before the operation. They became completely diabetic, plus the immunosuppression. So it's very difficult to manage after corticoid, uh, pro, uh, prograph. Well, with diabetes, it's, it, it's really difficult. And I have a, a little problem with this uh, total pancreatectomy because they have a uh, uh, problem of delayed gastric emptying. Because 
it is linked to the pancreatectomy plus the diabetes. So they have problem to, uh, to, to eat, mm -hmm. which uh, can uh, um, give some denutrition very hardly. So uh, we, we didn't perform total pancreatectomy, but remember I told you about Trudy, Trudy uh, who does that in the uh, United States, and they recommend total pancreatectomy when they are performing very large Resect arterial resection and replacement of the mesenteric artery. Daniel? Right. No, no, uh, which, uh, no, I have nothing to add. I think that uh, total pancreatectomy is a big handicap for the patient. And I think we have to uh, manage the anastomosis. You, you can do the Lawrence way, which is uh, with, uh, into, so, and you take the patient back to the OR for. Or you leave, or you let the pancreas like this? Not always, because when you let only six centimeters yeah. of the pancreas, uh, it's not used. In just it heals, it maybe heals. you can do endoscopically if you have a collection. You do a gastrochistectomy uh, endoscopically. Uh, well, only in thirty percent of the cases. Otherwise, it it's good. Yeah, you, you remove the tube after a few exactly, weeks. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's two options. <laughs> what, one question? One, one question. short question, yes. Yeah, short question. Uh, in the case of uh, combined uh, transplant, pancreas, Whipple, and uh, liver transplant, uh, Daniel, do you cover the patient with uh, somatostatin uh, to cover, to prevent fistula? Or? We, 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 we did it. We do it for, for high-risk anastomosis. We, uh, we give uh, an infusion of somatostatin for five days. Uh, the uh, evidence is not very high. And the randomized trial is negative, but uh, we do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, okay. Let me let, let me summarize this, this important question. I summarize. When there is oncological purpose, indication of doing liver transplantation plus whipper operation, there are several points to discuss. One this is the two, patient. One do one minute, one minute. Okay, okay, stay like this. It's Very nice. Up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what I, what I, I continue. I continue. I continue. I continue. I continue. Then you. I continue, Daniel. You. You will see. So there is several questions. One to do in one step or two step. Two in case you do in one step. What kind of pancreatic anastomosis you do? Two, if you do drainage or not. Three, according to John Isaac, is to, to suppress the risk of pancreatic fistula if you do a total pancreatic. I propose to answer this question that the three of you that have experience, Laurence, Daniel, and John, why not to put your case together and write a paper on this point? There is indication, oncologic indication, to do the two operations, sure. And then, what to do? And this is, I think, your answer to an actual question, which is debate now in the world. What do you think, all of the three? We need to put people who have experience. Good idea. I think we'd have to do a survey. We'd have to write to a number of uh, uh, centers with experienced people and try and uh, generate a survey and ask uh, this question and, and, and you know, get um, a consensus from a number of people because each individual has uh, too small an experience. Yeah. That's right. Agreed. Okay, I, 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 in, in the Compagnon, in the Compagnon group. Do you mm -hmm. agree? It's good yeah, to have people company. coming from the Compagnon. I'm sure Hugo, uh, with Eduardo, that, you go, I think a large like, a large experience. Okay, is, I, I am sure they are. Okay. I think we should include. I, I know that someone has a large experience of that, although he retired now, is Peter Neuhaus. Peter Neuhaus has done a, a few of those, and uh, I think we should include him. We need cases. No, okay. You know, uh, you may go. Uh, to ask Marcus Buckler to... No, no, no. Uh, to, he's not doing transplant. He's not doing <laughs> Okay. But, you I, know, I I, let me stay. We, we may try first. First, then, I push for the Compagnon, you know. 
Yes, 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 me too. Me too. I push for the compagnon. You know, me too is very appreciated. The compagnon, next one. Hugo, Hugo. Yes. General Secretary, may you do the inquiry among the, the compagnons? To ask of course. A okay. And then, voilà. and then. Comme ça, rien à faire. Oui. Tu peux. Il est volontaire. Il est volontaire, oui. Je vous ai montré un show. Pas volontaire. I, I, I just wanted to find, find uh, I showed you the picture of the patient, not because yes. we have to. Uh, did you see the picture of the patient with his kids? We. No, no, this, because yes. this, this was last week after he went home. And uh, I just want to stress that. We don't see the picture. We don't see the picture. Okay, I put it again. Uh, so this is because when we treat patients, it's not only compassionate, it's just that. We have to uh, think that when we do liver transplant, we do all the patients, we do alcoholics, we supposedly have start drinking. Sometimes we have here a policy that once or twice a year, we have a broker, you know, and that we can use for an out of the body patient. And I think that sometimes, it, so I'm not sure this patient because of the advanced disease, we, I don't know what's going to happen to him, but I, I wish him the best. Okay, thank you. He looks light and thin. Thin yes. is good. It was thin before. <laughs> thin, that's good for surgery. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, have, easy yeah. I have one question. Uh, Daniel, you said about uh, you're going to start uh, very soon the adjuvant treatment. Can I ask you what protocol are you going to use? Probably Gemox and Cisplatin. Yeah, Gemcitabine oh. and Cisplatin. Okay. And the immune. Everolimus, Emperor inhibitor. Everolimus, thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for this uh, interesting discussion. Now we open the discussion for the new cases. Um, so, Professor, okay. I have uh, one up right also. Hugo, you yes. have one? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, well, Laurence, can, can you be the chairman? Chairwoman, sorry, sorry. The chairwoman of this. <laughs> To excite. Wow. Like excite, excite. Do you need it? Excite is need, better. Really? Do you need that? Do you need that? Yes. Yes, when, yes. Please. When you go, when you go talks, no need of that. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Hugo, present your case. Careful, be careful. Okay, so, be careful. So, the horse is the excitator. Okay, so okay. I have an update, careful. and I have a new case that I, that I can present later. Uh, so I'll start with the update. <laughs> Sorry. Can you see this? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So last, uh, in the last meeting, we presented the case of a 45 years old female with uh, antiphospholipidic syndrome and lupus that have also an endocarditis. And she presented with a severe epigastric pain. And she had this. Uh, someone has the music on. Yeah. Maybe it's not necessary the music, right? Yes. So, if you remember, we have a, a patient, a 45 years old patient, that have um, uh, hepatic veins. Excuse me, you go. Can everybody shut in, in mode mute, not to have this music, please? Thank you. Okay. Go on, you go. Okay. So, if you remember, we have this. Uh, this uh, filiform hepatic veins, and we discussed the possibility of the possibility of a blood care syndrome. And at that point, uh, the time the patient was referred to our center, and we uh, dilatation of the hepatic veins, as we can see here. And that this was uh, three days before the discussion. We see the pressures of the 
hepatic veins of the inferior vena cava and the differential uh, pressure after the procedure. And uh, in our meeting, we, dis we also did a transregular liver biopsy and we decided to wait for the biopsy and to, to perform an angio MRI. So the patient uh, is not in our hospital. Uh, she, she was already discharged. And what <coughs> happened is this, in fact, after the dilatation, uh, the pain was completely gone. Uh, she was discharged out of the hospital four days after the procedure. And the histology of the transregular biopsy showed the slight portal and the lobular mononuclear inflammatory infiltrates, isolated hepatocellular necrosis, mild cholestasis, no cirrhosis, no fibrosis. And she's actually doing fine and completely asymptomatic for now. She has the MRI scheduled for next Monday. So this is the update for this case. Okay, any comment? What about long term? What about the risk of recurrence? Well, I do think that we have to rediscuss with MRI and to discuss what are the long term options because she's not in fact treated. She was yeah. treated symptomatically yeah. But we also have to discuss even uh, the possibility of liver transplantation. You go, don't, I, I'm surprised by the histology. It's too normal. Exactly. It is a fact. Okay. okay. So I, I'm a little suspicious about uh, We the, We also know that the transgender biopsy has several, biopsy has several limitations, and I'm not sure if with okay. the percutaneous biopsy we would gain a little more with this. Did you change? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Hugo, did you, did you, yes, you remember with the hematologist and change to the NOAC anticoagulation? Uh, we did not. We discussed this with them and they didn't feel that was, uh, that were, that was an advantage with this. Uh, we, we, we completed the, we, we didn't complete because you already have a complete coagulation profile and an um, um, and, uh, antibody an autoimmune profile, and we discovered nothing more uh, with the internal medicine and the hematologists. So at this point, she's exactly as she was, but with no pain for now. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, John, John, you want to? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Lorraine. Yeah, uh, Hugo, I'd just like to ask, you know, that, that pathology was surprising, but it's reassuring. There doesn't seem to be any sign of myeloproliferative disease, yes. mild inflammation, and certainly no chronicity. So probably this is acute bud chiari on the background of the antiphospholipid and needs the anticoagulation. My only comment um, is that what, what we would ordinarily do is not just dilate, we would expect recurrence. So we would have put a stent um, from, from the word go and um, you know just followed up with that anticoagulate but with a stent. That's true. I think that would be the, the most logical uh, option. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, mm -hmm. they, they felt uh, what the, the explanation that the radiologists uh, uh, said to me was that uh, they didn't feel they could place a stent in a way that was properly fixed and that there could be easy migration of the stent upwards. Okay. So this was the main reason in this case. Okay. Okay, thank you. Daniel? So just uh, finally, what's the mechanism of this, uh, I, this uh, but Chiari? Is it... Uh, that, is it related to her, her, um, her lupus and antiphospholipid? And uh, it's a stripper that was. I understand. I agree with John that you want to do more, uh, um, a more long-term treatment. Uh, a stent here uh, would also might also compromise later surgery, for example. So we have to be to think about that. But um, my question: Doesn't she have any kind of uh, of stricture that can be uh, or? Um, or a malformation that could be uh, repaired or something like a, uh, comment dire, um, you know, you, oh, I don't know how to find the word in French. Oh, what's French? It's not French. No, 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 even in French, I don't know the name. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I mean some congenital defect or something, a stricture. Yes. Like, you know, uh, I don't find the word there. You know, Daniel, well, yeah, they, there are some diaphragm. Diaphragm, thank you very much. Yes. Different. But me, I'm sorry, but I, I didn't see it uh, really. But it was a stricture only on the right hepatic vein, isn't it? It was mainly on the right, 
uh, the left and the middle were Let's were more uh, were more uh, I would say more open. Uh, they were they were thinner, but not completely stenosed. It's usually not a, not a dead dead. it's not one vein only. No. Yes, Professor Bismuth. Yes, uh, if there is only one vein which is obstructed with that fact, it is not a bacterial syndrome. Yes. But normally there is a lot of communication between yeah. the hepatic vein, yeah. and uh, but this is not. This is it could be the first step of of, uh, of bacterial syndrome. Yes. Usually, when you look at the story of uh, two uh, bacterial syndrome, you see uh, some episode of pain, but we have nothing. Mm -hmm. That means it could be that there is one vein obstructed, then another episode of obstruction of the second vein, and the bacteria arrived, that means the full picture of the theory, when the third vein is occluded. At that time, there is a, a superiority by the uh, Spiegel long vein. You know, I observe one case of uh, no bacteria syndrome, but we have a picture, a morphologic picture of bacteria syndrome, which was a huge Spiegel lobe with two, the two other lobes atrophy. I speak lobe, a French name, uh, morphologic name, the two lobes atrophied, like uh, Béret Basque <coughs> on the Spiegel lobe, but without symptom. And I am sure it was a sequelae of a Bertiari syndrome, step by step, without. That means each one was compensated by the atrophy of the, of the collateral circulation. You understand what I said? Yes. That means that in your case, uh, it could be that it is the first step of a future bacteria syndrome. It is why you don't observe uh, on the pathology of the liver parenchyma, there is no trouble, for there was compensation. And this is a curious case, because uh, in bacteria it's not a stricter, it's uh, normally it's a, it's a, it's thrombosis, a thrombosis, thrombosis of thrombosis, the exactly. virus. so it's, yeah. uh, it's quite curious. Especially in the context yeah. of uh, antiphospholipid disease. I, I, I agree. But, uh, I agree. Usually, those, uh, those antiphospholipid syndrome are yet on uh, anticoagulation. Mm -hmm. So, any any other comment? Yeah. Uh, I, I think I think that's why excuse that's why. You, excuse, excuse, Gina, first, Professor Bismuth. Yes, Professor. Yes. Yeah. I agree with you in the, the, the this correlation syndrome. The diaphragm is not typical, of course. But to answer to your question, in Bacari, there is no, not observe a diaphragm. Uh, for when there is diaphragm, one vein, as I told you, there is no syndrome. But diaphragm on the vena cava, just above the liver, is a cause of Bacari syndrome. <laughs> But yeah. every syndrome associated with the vena cava. Mm. But that means diaphragm may cause. But of mm. course, you need to have diaphragm of the three vein or on the vena cava. But uh, that, that's why, and I think that's what Hugo is waiting for, that's why this uh, vascular MRI is important because you're going to yeah. see beyond, you're going to see in the chest level, and you will have the mapping of all the, ba the vessels, and that will give you an idea what's happening, because sometimes just one stricture of one right hepatic vein is not enough to explain what happened on the liver, especially that this lady has this autoimmune disease. So this is one more reason why you need this uh, mapping that you're going to have very shortly, and then you can make your decision. Yes. Okay, any other comment? Nobody to excite? But yeah. you, you may excite yourself uh, by giving conclusion. <laughs> My conclusion is I don't understand very well this case. Yes, it's atypical. So uh, let's wait for uh, the, the final conclusion. And Hugo, we are waiting for that. Okay. Uh, Ma 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 had, had raised his name, his hand. Yes. Is this? Ma 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 Comment about the case of uh, Pierre Alain Clavien last uh, month? Hmm? Yes. But Pierre, Pierre is not here. Yes. Yeah, but what what the, was the what was the case? 
the purpose is not to criticize friends, Professor Bismuth. We never do this. Uh, Pierre Alain presented to Lance a case of duodenal adenomatosis uh, with the need for a liver resection. And, and finally, I mean, facing to the necessity to associate a whipper operation, he, 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 he used a, a conservative treatment because. I mean, a whipper operation was considered to be a, a too uh, dangerous uh, 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 operation. So I would like to make uh, uh, to show a technique which is not very well known by the HPB surgeon, and uh, which has been um, reported in 1990 by the Mayo Clinic team, which is called pancreas preserving total duodenectomy. I may show you the slide. It is usual when they discuss the case that the, the one that presents the case is here. So, why, uh, if you agree, is to get the next session. I think Pierre Alain uh, apologizes for not being here. Uh, it, could be come at the end. it could be come at the end of the session. He's busy now. He, he sent me a message. He's busy. That means, please, it's better to wait. For I have also a uh, question about the case. I am not alone. Several people are questioned to ask to Pierre Alain, and you will be one too. Uh, so, uh, Jean Francois, can you keep your case for the next session? And I will, uh, we will uh, advise uh, Pierre Alain to be here and to open the discussion in this case. I have already sent a comment to Pierre Alain. It, it's already done. That's yes. okay, but uh, wait. No, other have to discuss, not only you. With the case of Pierre Alain. Okay, so I come back to Laurence now, and Laurence decides for what to do now. What to do now? Um, uh, you stop. I, I stop the, the discussion on the case of Hugo, and then what? And who who has a, another case? I so have Hugo one. has yeah, a new case. Also. Hugo has a new case to present. Oh. Hugo, yes. you can you can Hugo present can your present? new case, please. Okay. Yes. And uh, so, the new ex who will be the John? Can you be the the next excitator? Uh, yes, but I'm not as exciting as Lauren, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, no. Try, <laughs> you try, you try. No. <laughs> okay, so I start with you, guys. Uh, Pietro is here. Pietro. Okay. So we have a new, a new case. This is a 33 years old male. He's followed regularly in a consultation of hepatology due to portal hypertension. And in his uh, etiological study, uh, the blood tests were within normal reference values. Uh, total proteins were normal. Uh, the um, uh, autoimmune uh, you go. tests. Uh, you go, please. Yes? Uh, we do, we don't we can't see the presentation now. Okay, yes, I, I can see it. Yeah, um, we have just. Okay, can good. I can see it. All right. No, we can see. It. Yes, yes. You can. It's there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So he has an etiological study of his liver disease that shows nothing connected to to autoimmune diseases. The viral serology is negative. He has no family history of liver disease or hereditary telangiectasia. Serolopalismin alpha antitrypsin negative, no previous history of medication, drug use, alcohol, and in the Doppler ultrasound, in fact, he has only a portal hypertension. Uh, the liver has no signs of cirrhosis, no hypertrophy of caudate lobe, no liver lesions. The portal vein at some point is 13.5 millimeters of diameter with hepatopetal flux. He has an enlarged splenoportal axis and collateral circulation anteriorly to the pancreas mainly. Uh, the left and right hepatic veins seem to have a slight caliper reduction, but the flux seems normal. And the spleen has a longitudinal distance of uh, measurement of uh, 18 centimeters. At this point, this patient lives in the south of Portugal. He has a liver biopsy that shows chronic hepatitis with mild activity, uh, fibrosis and distortion of architecture without evident etiology. There is absence of uh, obliterative portal venopathy. 
And uh, he has also an MRI then in the um, out of the our hospital that shows, in fact, signs of signs of portal hypertension, splenomegaly, gastric and esophageal varices, and the, in the hilar region there seems to be a thrombosis uh, of the portal vein with portal cavernomatosis. Again, the liver looks normal. It has iron deposits, uh, and uh, this uh, would favor the diagnosis of portal hypertension from a non-serotic cause. Uh, during this time, he had at least three major episodes of varicial bleeding. The last one in September 2020, he was first treated with sclerotherapy, then elective ligation of esophageal varices. He is presently medicated uh, with a B blocker. And in December 2020, on 31st of December, he has an episode of rupture of a gastric varix. Uh, an endoscopic therapy was attempted, but it was not effective. And finally, a Linton balloon was placed that controlled the bleeding. At this point, he does a CT scan that shows uh, portal and hepatic veins that are uh, at the permeable uh, with the thrombosis of the right sectorial portal branch, ectasy of the splenic vein, and large esophageal varices. And at this point, it is uh, then transferred to our hospital. So we can see here the CT scans, the arterial phase, the venous phase here. I can do this a little slower if you want, where you can see this large spleen and this large splenic vein. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we can also see here that at a certain point the portal vein appears to be more or less um, uh, disappeared at a certain point. And uh, Hugo, yeah. in the liver, you were, you were mentioning there was some intrahepatic portal vein uh, thrombus. Is that correct? In the right posterior sector. Right posterior sector. But, but, posterior but, sector. And you, you said there was a, a cavernous transformation at the hilum, but it looks like a normal portal vein, uh, actually. Yeah. Or could you point that out to us? Yes. Uh, in fact, the... Uh, this was described in an MRI that we never received. Okay. So, what we see here... The varices around the gullet are very see impressive. This, this collateral yeah. circulation. Yeah. If you follow the portal vein, it in fact continues with the, mesent the superior mesenteric vein, but the connection between the splenic vein and the, and the portal vein seems to be gone here. I don't know if you can see this correctly. No. No, no. Can't see that, no, no. Yeah, I see. Mm. You. Okay. So if you have the... I'll try to show it here. This is a more light phase. Is there anything we need to uh, find on these images? Well, the only thing we, we found relevant was this large hepatic vein, this apparent deconnection of the splenic vein with the portal trunk. Uh, Can you show that? Because I, I didn't see that. I'll try in this image. Let's see if we can do it, see it better here. So it would be sinistro portal hypertension? Probably. Probably. That's what I would say. Large spleen gastric varices. Yes. Mainly. May, may I say something? Uh, yeah, Professor. Yeah, okay. Please go ahead. Yeah. 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 Uh, but uh, you go until now. It, it seemed uh, uh, until now it seemed to be the case. I may say usual for extrahepatic portal hypertension discovered late. For it is usually it is in the early age that yeah. this kind of portal thrombosis is discovered. <laughs> Thirty years is little late, but uh, I observe cases like this one. The only point which is not uh, normal 
is what you said, the separation between the splenic vein and the mesenteric vein. Are you yeah. sure of that? No, not, not entirely uh, sure, question, I think. Are you sure? So, yeah. you know, it is not usual. It is not usual to have a portal shrink in an extrahepatic portal block with a cavernoma at the level of the hilus of the portal vein to have, in addition, uh, something isolated that this uh, process. Yeah. Usually this process is um, umbilical vein process, you know, uh, uh, at yes. birth. Uh, usually it is that. And then you add something else in this case that the separation between the two. Well, if it is not the separation, the treatment is very simple. It uh, splenorenal anastomosis as it is uh, performed in children. But yes. in your case, we stop on the separation between the two. Yeah, I, I will say, uh, in case it is not possible, we need to do an arterial, what we call arteriopartography. That means uh, to have the late phase of an arteriography, a mesentric arteriography. Uh, uh, I is think it possible to do that? Is it uh, possible to yes, do that? We could do this. Uh, but uh, in this case, I think there is a small connection in the in the um, in the first CT scan here, I think the splenic vein here connects with uh, with the, the portal vein at this point. So I think at least some communication exists. Okay. So Hugo, if okay. in summary, then I think you've shown us that there is a connection. I, I cannot see a cavernous transformation. You mentioned it was present on MR, but you've probably not seen that. Uh, I can add, John, that we yeah. we have the disc the description that there is. Yeah. But what we have with in, in our exams doesn't show that. Okay. So basically, as we said, uh, this is an extra hepatic um, portal hypertension. You did mention on one of your slides that you thought it. Um, you you mentioned it could be obliterative uh, uh, a portal vein, but on the histology, there was no evidence of portal insufficiency. It looks yes. like the uh, um, portal triads have got normal portal veins. So that obliterative uh, portal disease is probably not an etiology. Would you agree? Yes. And I might, I might add that this histology is from 2014. Okay. Okay. So we have an extra hepatic uh, 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 portal hypertension. So we have, we have, uh, would you like us to uh, d discuss this now? Are you going to give some further yes, information? So what would you so do at this We have a lot of experts on this, including Surendra. So, who, who so, has anybody understood anything? Does he have a portal vein thrombosis and cavernous transformation or not? It seems that not. He has and a portal he, hypertension. And he has yeah, a portal hypertension. He doesn't have a portal uh, cavernous transformation. So does he have an obstructed splenic vein or not? No. I, I would say the, 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 the main component of his hypertension is in, this, in, this, is in the splenic territory, but I wouldn't say it is totally obstructed. Correct. So you showed the, you the context. Showed connection there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, I can see. Um, uh, uh, Surendra, is that a new hand? Surendra, yeah. you want to yeah. comment? Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, see, it's uh, as everybody is saying, it's not a very clear cut thing. There are two things. Uh, one, if you look at the liver, if Hugo can tell us whether the portal vein branches intrahepatically, can they be traced up to the just short of the capsule of the liver. Okay. If that is so, then there is a condition known as uh, non serotic portal fibrosis, which is common in the eastern part of the country or the world, that is Japan, India, and other places. Uh, in that case, we do see such a hugely dilated splenic vein, ectatic, and huge splenum again. And these patients do present in a later stage of life. That's, uh -oh. one, that's one possibility. So you have to trace that uh, portal vein branches if it can be traced to the um, subcapsular area. Because there's a. You can uh, see here, for example, <laughs> you can see here for the right anterior branch, the right posterior has signs of thrombosis here. Mm. Yeah. And the right anterior, I think we can follow the small branches almost up to the capsule. So there is a thrombosis at the level of the intrahepatic branches of the portal vein. Mm -hmm. Yes, here. And Surendra, can I ask you, is there any uh, histology that can help confirm that? Um, 
uh, it's difficult. Nasal biopsy is the one which can tell you, and both from both the lobes of the liver has to be taken to look for uh, if there is a fibrosis. Okay, and not the distortion of the architecture of the liver. Right. The lobular architecture is preserved in non-cirrhotic portal fibrosis, unlike in the cirrhosis. Right. So that is the clinching point on the histology. Right. Uh, the other possibility is that yes, it is a vascular disease basically. That's why we have thrombosis of the intrahepatic radicals, and even if you see the portal vein, it's not of normal size portal vein. Okay, what you are seeing, you have got a feeder going to the left branch of the portal vein, and there is another one going to the right branch of the portal vein. It's not a. Can you trace the confluence which is dividing the right and left hepatic left portal vein? Here. Yeah, it is there. Okay. So, but it is attenuated portal vein. So it is not a normal size portal vein because if it is intrahepatic obstruction purely, then there should have been extrahepatic portal vein should have been also dilated. Mm. So there is a vascular phenomena which is happening here, which is responsible for the obstruction. The treatment part, as far as concerned, is yes, you can do splenectomy with the proximal line of lesion. One possibility. Or one can do a, a warring shunt that would take care of the encephalopathy. Okay. I know Professor Bismuth will uh, challenge me on that because uh, he has a strong reservations, and uh, but that is one possibility. Okay. So, irrespective of the exact diagnosis, Surendra, I think you have hit the nail on the head. The approach really is to get management of this portal hypertension. And we can see that this young patient is, uh, we're not uh, in control. He's had uncontrolled bleeding. So, so this is the major thing to get control of the portal hypertension. We probably don't need an exact diagnosis, uh, but we, we need a plan for, for management. Okay. I think, uh, Petro, did you have your hand up? It's not, no. Uh, okay. Uh, G uh, Gina, do you have a finger up? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, I wanted to go back to the basics exactly because uh, uh, if I understood well with your clinical case, this patient has been transferred to your center uh, with the Linton. Yes. Is that it? So it is an emergency, right? Yes. So it is an uncontrolled bleeding. So yes. in that case, I agree, you have to have uh, urgent imaging, but I don't... I mean, I think here there's only one option to do. You want to control the bleeding. If you failed endoscopically, the last step is going to be to put the tips because you know that he has a portal hypertension. You need to stop the bleeding. Then the case of what's the cause of it, it's going to be the second step because here you're faced with a young man who is bleeding and all the option that you've done has failed. So I need to know what's going on. I know he has a portal hypertension. I think I will go for a tips. This is my approach in this particular case. Okay, so okay. That's, uh, that, that's the tips we're dealing, we, we, we think we're dealing with an extra hepatic portal hypertension. And up to now we were discussing uh, shunting, but you think Gina that a tips might work in this case. I imagine we're going to need some pressures, uh, yeah. pressure measurements before we do that. Of course, of course, of course, yeah. it's part of it. Hugo's showing us something now, go on Hugo. So this is the tips, right? These are the images of the tips. It was, uh, in fact, a difficult procedure. And portal vein pressure was 23. The hepatic vein was five. The transhepatic gradient was 18. Uh, in fact, they could measure the pressures, but they couldn't dilate or place a stent. So the tips was not effective. But in fact, the bleeding uh, stopped after the Linton balloon removal. Uh, and the upper GI endoscopy showed two fundacastic varices with signs of recent bleeding, but no active bleeding at okay. that point. Patient was stable? Yeah. Should so I continue? We have, we have a reprieve, but we're not out of the woods by a long shot. I think we're still, we're still uh, going to face trouble here. Okay, yes. so um, uh, Professor Bismuth, uh, I'll call on you, please. Yeah. Now, I don't understand about the tips. What do you mean by uh, tips? For me, a tips, usual tips, is between the portal vein and the vena cava. Uh -huh. But here, 
The portal, intrahepatic portal vein, there is no hypertension into the intrahepatic portal vein. There is no indication of tips in extrahepatic. We could consider no. only a, a portal vein uh, stent placement, for example. Excuse me, you go. Uh, yes. There is a, a, a portal, yes. gra there is a gradient. Gradient. Okay. See the pressure again, Hugo? Could you show us the measurements again? If you look at if, the wedge. Um, if uh, there is this gradient, it's an intrahepatic portal of contention. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Where you speak portal vein pressure, which kind of portal vein pressure? It is the pre sinusoidal or the post sinusoidal? Pre. The pre sinusoidal. That's pre sinusoidal. So the gradient is 18. It's mm -hmm. like yes. a cirrhosis. At that, okay, at that's, that time, it's like a cirrhosis. At that time, it is intrahepatic block. Yes. Yeah. It's into that, it is yeah. pointing. To that. Uh, there is and another. It, the extrahepatic findings are secondary, probably. Yeah. Uh, Professor Bishop, carry the same on. Pathology. It is not the same pathology. We have another pathology now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go to Pietro and then surrender. Pietro, please. Pietro, Microphone. You're muted still. You're still muted. I'm lost because you present a case of extrahepatic portal hypertension where I suspect and I can see a block not only of the splenic but also the mesenteric vein if I saw correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, f it's you, you treat with a tips uh, an extrahepatic portal hypertension. Either the definition of extrahepatic portal hypertension is wrong or uh, the tips is wrong. Um, at, uh, on, uh, I, I, I can't get, and then if on the top of the extrahepatic portal tension, this patient also has a cirrhosis, then uh, you were lucky uh, to uh, have done the wrong thing, which is the TIPS, that was successful because you had the wrong diagnosis. Um, so uh, I'm lost. I'm no, lost. I like for me, lost. this case would have been, I would have asked to measure uh, the, uh, whether the portal flow inside the liver was flowing normally and for me this would have been a case for um, a, a shunt between the mesenteric and the intrahepatic portal vein like a rex shunt um, but not a tips correct you know this this was decided we first started to measure the pressures and then we decided to perform yes, but, but, uh, uh, from the tips Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to access the extrahepatic port hypertension through the liver and try to negotiate a stenosis of uh, the portomesenteric confluent or the splenoportomesenteric forehead, that's right. But I cannot see conceptually the tips for a extrahepatic portal hypertension. So of that's a valid point. Not you for an extrahepatic, yes. Explain that to us. And, and also, I just want to mention that the only real objective measurement we have here is a high intrahepatic portal vein pressure. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we thought it was extrahepatic, but we're seeing yeah. evidence of an intrahepatic. Professor Vista? Yeah. Yes, I am lost too. But there are contradic contradictions between some signs that are reported here. And I regret, uh, Hugo, that you did not perform and a portal vein imaging, that means arteriopathography. It is so simple to do arteriography, to have a nice picture of the portal vein. All the level, you know, uh, you see mesenteric vein, yeah. splenic vein, by the... Uh, I don't know if you uh, can see it here. We can you see know, it. Yeah. Really, before doing all this, I will have performed, I will have performed an arteriopathography. We need the imaging, you know, uh, you have the pressure, you have the biology, you have the biopsy, but you don't have a correct imaging of the portal system. When right. we speak about extrahepatic block, we need to have an exact picture of the, the portal system. All okay. the, the veins, well, hepatic, splenic, and so on. A plea for more imaging. I'm just going to go to Surendra, then I, I, I believe um, it's going to be uh, Laurent Shish after that. Surendra? Yeah. Uh, so what I said in the beginning, there's a confusing picture here. Mm. And now with the pressures, they are going in favor of a cirrhosis. 
whether the stock is superimposed on the non sporadic portal fibrosis or the extrapatic portal venous thrombosis with the recanalization or partial recanalization of the uh, portal vein okay now what is the solution this patient is bleeding from the varices now mainly from the gastric varices and the tips which was attempted they couldn't put the stent so the pressure are not coming down so one of the technique which is described and which is used is because he could enter into the portal vein you go through the portal vein go into the splenic vein and embolize all the collaterals going to the gastric varices that will control the acute bleed okay and there are results now which say that it does give the long term control as well not as good as the surgery but since the cirrhosis is there then there is confusion about the surgery what surgery you are going to offer correct the patient may ultimately go for the liver transplant in the future but surrender can I on the, the spot here is there is a brto which can be done again go back into the portal vein and they should embolize the all the collaterals going to the feeding the gastric varices and the esophageal varices because if you see the ct in the beginning there are large collaterals around the esophagus and around the stomach so that is the way to go for this case as far as the control of the acute bleeding okay and then so follow up how we deliver here thank you thank you how, yeah Yeah, so can I can put you on the spot. You have a patient with normal liver function, a 33-year-old, I believe, young yes. patient, and you're suggesting embolization, which which we know is is uh, to to be done really as as the last chance to control this with normal factors. Yeah. Uh, sorry, with a normal liver function, a failed tips, and a young patient. Uh, wouldn't you recommend a shunt procedure in this patient? Yeah. So. You can say there is a child age rot. That's right. For the anti-epileptic pressure, they are favoring the cirrhosis. There is no doubt about it. Okay. okay, it is not favoring EHPBO. Okay, yeah. it is not favoring NCPA. So it is early cirrhosis. So this is child age rot. Yes, child age rot. You can treat by doing the partial shunts or the selective shunt. Okay, but if the patient is actively bleeding right now, I will prefer. a temporizing procedure which may have a long term effect also because we are to have been shown to be effect okay you can look at the uh, ct photogram and see if there is a natural shunt natural connection between the splenic vein to the left renal vein then they don't have to go through the liver and the portal vein they can go to the transfemoral approach and embolize the collateral okay so we have okay. we have Well, this is a difficult case. So obviously, there's uh, one approach to get more information, as Professor Bismuth said, and then surrender. You said maybe an emergency treatment if we're really stuck by embolizing, and that that's obviously valid. Or do we go straight to shunting now, uh, without a firm understanding of uh, you know because we're still confused between the intra and extra. So yeah, I will welcome any suggestions now, Pietro. Please, yeah. Uh, I I still need a drawing. of this patient's anatomy i cannot say anything intelligent unless you show me where the block is but the uh, okay the, we the, saw the yeah lorenz sorry i was supposed to call on you please yeah yes. lorenz in fact i i don't understand why we discussed at the beginning the extra hepatic uh, block because now the the judge the key point is the pressures mm. if the pressures are <coughs> right it is a cirrhosis or any uh, an hepatopathy so it's like a lot of our patient it's a hypertension a portal hypertension that we have to treat by a tips exactly and my first question is why was it difficult why didn't they succeed and the second point is to my opinion maybe uh, there is the 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 the, the spleen is very huge and participate to the uh the 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 increase of port hypertension so anyway for your patient the problem you remove the balloon and it stop bleeding so we are yes. not in an emergency now we can just think and uh, my my second question is everybody uh, is talking of a portal shunt my question is 
Is a splenectomy enough? Right, and I think there's a comment about hyperflow and the spleen exactly on that, and whether a splenectomy would 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 be um, enough for for this patient. Yeah, difficult, really difficult to ju judge on that. But you know, Lauren, can I just can I just draw you on that point? You said we're okay now; we have time, but um, we don't really know when he's going to bleed again after the balloon uh, is moved. Yeah. But I don't. Uh, why? Why not to to try again the tips? I don't understand why okay, it was that's so difficult. One specific question: Can we just go to um, Hugo before we go yes. to Professor Bisman? Hugo, is there any uh, value in trying to repeat? Is there a technical issue? Uh, well, I can say the, the the radiology team is very experienced in this type of procedures, and they spent more than one hour trying to dilate and to pass the stents, and it was okay. impossible for them. Okay, so, so they, no, they decided no, no not to do for this fight. patient. No tips. Yes. I think we've agreed that it's technically not possible. Professor Bismut? No, I think I agree with Pietro. Really, there is many things we don't understand. For instance, we are discussing about cirrhosis, but somebody said, Hugo, you said the presinusoidal pressure is elevated, but presinusoidal elevation is not cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is posthumous. Yeah. So I need to have more precision about, about uh, the, the, cat the result of catheterism. So we have no good imaging, uh, emphasized catheterism. Really, I think we cannot discuss a treatment if we don't have a clear diagnosis and a clear picture of what I think. Personally, I can do nothing in this patient. I don't understand. There are too many okay. things. Uh, uh, too many things which is uh, in discordance. Um, okay, Gina? Uh, Gina? Hugo. Hugo. I asked yes. uh, Hugo. Uh, I, I, uh, can you Hugo. clarify? That would you clarify. Want, Hugo, we need, we need satisfaction here. What's going on? Okay, let, let, me just, let me just then explain. So, the, 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 different, the gradual difference, it, was, it, was, it is between the, the stuck uh, hepatic vein and the portal vein pressure. This is 18. The, the, we then performed, uh, we then repeated the biopsy. The transjugular bi biopsy was inconclusive. The percutaneous biopsy showed no inflammatory infiltrate, thickening of the central orbular vein, mild sinusoidal dilatation, and the fibrosis grade three in six. This is, okay. Okay. My suicide yeah. dilatation means, means post sinusoidal. Not presinusoidal. So it's starting to look like a early cirrhosis picture overall. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I agree. Yeah. I would like. Uh, Is that your interpretation, Hugo? Does your team feel you're dealing with a cirrhotic or um, a patient I, here? I, yeah. We feel that is an uh, early cirrhosis. Cirrhosis. Uh, early cryptogenic cirrhosis because of the, all of the studies inconclusive until now. Uh, yeah. with a marked component of portal hypertension, right. but with the normal function. Okay. We, we repeated the angio CT scan. I couldn't retrieve the images because this okay. is a very recent case. Uh, okay. But what we thought, in fact, is that, the, is that uh, to, to relieve this part of pressure, uh, we could propose, in fact, a uh, spinal renal uh, distal shunt. Yeah. So you've got an early cirrhosis, you've got maintained liver function, you have a, a critical situation really with potential re-bleeding and uh, you, you feel you can do a, a, a shunt for this patient uh, to control the portal hypertension. Yeah, we can't exclude the possibility of liver transplantation, but in fact Later. we, we, yeah. Yeah. we thought that, that at this point as a, as, a, as a most preventive procedure, the shunt would be in order. Okay. What, what do you feel? Do we have enough information to, uh, to recommend this? Um, personally, I, th I think there probably is enough to do a shunt right now. Uh, Gina? You're on mute, Gina. Yeah. No, now we're talking after, but I want just to stress one point very important, if I may say so. This kind of patient, you receive them, you know, urgent bleeding from cirrhotic, portal hypertension and everything. I just want to go back to three steps. First step, 
absolutely true you need to have to to do the measures okay the pressure measures to see what what type of portal hypertension do you have second yes you need to have a proper imaging and i don't unfortunately trust very well the ct angel because sometimes the reconstruction is not enough a proper portography and uh, angiogram is very important that's what i do Thirdly, and I stress and I agree with the, with the, with the Laurence, I personally uh, I'm questioning why it failed the tips because usually it's very, in particular situation, I need to know why exactly they couldn't do it. But now we are beyond that. We are beyond. Yes. Now you have this guy. I agree. It's probably an early stage cirrhotic patient. Now you have to discuss if he's stable, what type of portal uh, 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 shunt you're going to, to do with less uh, risk of uh, operation. I'm not sure you go for an early transplantation at that stage. I, unless you have a lot of graft, I don't know how you can manage to do that. But no, what probably, Gina is probably not thinking of that. It's his good liver function. I think he's looking for a, a shunt right now. And we agree uh, that the tips, that ship has sailed. Professor Bisman? No, I have I have a question to Hugo. Hugo, yes. you said you discussed liver transplantation in this case. Uh, we we didn't uh, we we put this hypothesis, but we ruled it for now because he has a, he has a, no. a normal liver shunk, uh, function, but it it is in our minds. I would say. No, I am I am surprised to discuss liver transplantation in a young patient with normal liver function and with only port hypertension. You know, I, I, I am agree, I, I am sorry to say that, but uh, I observe sometimes this when we don't understand the disease of the liver. The proposal at the end is to do liver transplantation. It's like like you, you, your car has a problem, engine not working. You put it in It could be the carbu the carburetor is blocked, and he say change the engine. Of course, if, if you change the engine, the car is working. But I think there is the easiest way to to do the repair. Okay, I uh, think Hugo, Hugo is planning a, a repair. Um, okay, uh, uh, Russia, your hands up, please. Yeah, Russia, you are mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, please. Yes, okay. Well, I've joined uh, a little bit late the discussion and the presentation, but what I gather, and please correct me if I'm wrong, there is a portal hypertension, uh, pre-sinusoidal, and preserved liver function. It reminds me very much with the cystosomiasis that you used to see quite a lot in Egypt. Uh, uh, they used to do shunts in the 60s and 70s, and they're doing the sclerotherapy. Uh, now, the, the, the rates are much less, but just before thinking of shunts now that you've mentioned, we used to perform um, splenectomy and vasoligation. I wonder if you consider in a situation like that, uh, especially the liver functions are uh, normal, knowing that the, uh, the splenectomy, that they have, they, it used to have a risk of 10% portal vein thrombosis. Uh, but it could be a life-saving and preserving uh, the, with the preserved liver function, uh, they could save him uh, the liver, go through a liver transplant. I wonder what's your opinion if it's still on now. Okay, so that's for splenectomy and a devascularization, Rashad. Your yes, yes that's what I'm suggesting. It's one yeah. of the options that you used to do in cases yes, of liver my memory is that the results were, were very poor. I'm, I'm, I'm sure probably some sent the better results, but the long term control. Uh, the results of that were, were, were not great. Uh, anybody want to comment on, on that approach? Yeah. yeah. Uh, can I? Yeah, Surendra, please. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I will make two comments. First thing, like Professor Vismar and everybody, child is erotic, no transplant right now. Uh -huh. Second, splenectomy was proposed. Just splenectomy again is out. Because just splenectomy means aggravation of portal hypertension. If you do the splenectomy that we do in EHPBO, extrahepatic portal vein thrombosis, then you combine it with a shunt surgery. Okay, so then just do the splenectomy. As far as the, <coughs> the splenectomy with devascularization, 
yes we have published it for acute emergency as a long term also for a non serotic port hypertension mm -hmm. and this are long back i particularly this in 90s okay if it is done like what the sigra used to do with a modification which we have developed it gives the long term results i have patients who are living 20 years without the okay but that is only for the non serotic port hypertension mm -hmm. here we are talking of a patient who has got early serotic we have proven that by the all the whatever uh, information we have got available with us so there is no question of doing a devascularization with um dysplexia i agree with you go that he should plan for a selective shunt in this case we know the sb uh, sense taken black knot cube when it is removed in 48 hour 72 hour there can high risk of bleeding uh -huh. okay and that is a window of opportunity to do something before the next bleed comes because next bleed can be better okay okay so, should i continue yes so please you, yeah. I'm sorry to take so, such a long time yeah, for yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, so we decided to do this osprenorinal shunt. Uh, in fact, the liver was completely normal macroscopically. We repeated the biopsy, and, and this is you can see here the, the splenic vein uh, enormously enlarged to the left renal vein here. Wow. So this is this is the, the the final part of the of the case. This was a. Uh, a very recent case operated this week. It's going well. So we still more need more information on this uh, that I can update you, uh, namely of the biopsy. But so this is it. Thank you, thank you, Hugo. That really is a fascinating case. We look forward to the uh, update. And I, I, I must say, uh, every time you come on, Hugo, you you have fantastic cases from your your center. It'd be a wonderful place for people to train. It is, in fact, a, an odd case, a difficult case, I think. Okay, thank okay. you. So, I, any final comments? Maybe just one final comment. Gina, do you want to say something before we head uh, over? Yeah. Uh, when was the operation? This week, he said. Yes, Monday. Yeah. yeah. You had a, you had a great decrease of the gradient. Uh, yes, uh, I'm not. I don't have all the details here, Gina, for you, for you to 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 tell you. I, I still. Okay. Right. Yep. I still do not understand the pressure you you she showed yeah. us because the pressure uh, the, the gradient is 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 what's more odd I think because it's it, it doesn't look that he has a liver disease. He has not liver disease even with a biopsy. You can't explain this portal hypertension with a a, 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 a very mild a, a beginning of a cirrhosis. It was impossible. So there is a. Uh, controversy in the in in your data, I think. This, uh, we, we could have a, a as this was very difficult to place the stent and the measurement. There could be something wrong in the measurement. I think so. Of the, I think so. I think so. Of the in the radiology, it's a possibility. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, Hugo, uh, why you distal spinal Uh well, we we considered uh, there was there was a a point here next to renal vein where it was uh, where it was uh, probably the most uh, the most uh, adequate place to, to perform shunts. I think we have other options also. We could perform a, a side to side uh, shunt here. Um, mm. This would be another option, I think. Mm. Okay, Hugo. Um, last last question. Uh, did did you measure intraop pressures before and after? Anything to tell us there? Uh, we did, in fact, but I don't have the data here to show you. Okay. I'm sorry. So we will we'll be for a, a full update from you next time. In yeah. the updates. Oh, thank you, thank you, Hugo. Thanks a lot. Great case, uh, Professor Bismuth. I hand back to you now. Thank you. Get out of thank here. You. Thank you, John. Thank you, Hugo. You were both excellent. Thank you. Now we go to another case. Uh, there are two cases remaining. Laurence, you have a case to present? Ready. I have a... And a then very... it's Daniel. And after Daniel, we have two cases. I have a so simple... Laurence. Okay, Laurence. And uh, who will be the chairman? Uh, Daniel. Daniel Cherki. 
Daniel, you are the excitator. Real excitator, I hope. Je ne sais pas comment on fait. Ça y est. Ah, oh, oh, non, c'est pour ces conséquences. Mais il y a une question, Daniel, Daniel, sorry, Daniel qui t'a, Daniel qui t'a regardé, Daniel, why there are so many people outside, I see you, there are six compagnons outside, I think Google Meet, we may have 16 people of Google Meet. They are not six, they are not six. Can you increase the number of people on the screen? Uh, the number of each uh, people who, who uh, appears in the chat box is up to every to each Google Meet user. So you are not 18, I guess you are not 18 on the screen, and there are people you know, Jack List, uh, uh, Marcelo, who are not on the screen. Why? Perhaps it's because we have screen sharing, so the the screen occupies most of the uh, the meeting room, and then not many people can appear here. Just those who ones who are speaking. Laurence, are you ready? I, I I am. Do you see my slides? Oh, yes, but you have to put on full full screen slideshow because we don't we see uh, we see your screen actually. Can you put it on slideshow? Yep. Okay, okay, I do. Do you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Perfect. Okay, so this is a very uh, a, a simplest uh, uh, case report and uh, to relax you. So this is a female, 20 year old, admitted in another center for mild pancreatitis. And they performed a ultrasonography, and the radiologist concludes that there was a double gallbladder, one with gallstone and the other without. And this is the CT scan performed just uh, at the moment of uh, the pancreatitis. As you see, a large pancreas. Gallbladder. And another structure with gallstone. Okay. So do you need other investigations? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. MRCP. Yeah. Okay, that's it. An MRI first. <coughs> Okay. This is the T2 sequence. It's not very good, but you can see that this tractor with gallstones. And here the reconstruction. Maybe I can do it. Okay, this is the key image. Okay.
what is your diagnosis? Is it a double gallbladder? Okay. Anyone wants to talk? Diverticule. Laurence? No. No comments? Laurence, may I say something? I think it is so rare to have a double gallbladder. It, it could be, uh, why not to think about uh, some diverticula, diverticulum around it? It could be a duodenal diverticulum. Uh, uh, this is only an uh, option, you know. Uh, the for only the I think there is a lot of options. It could be a collodocal cyst. It could be a duodenal yes. diverticulum. Yes. It could be also a duodenal duplication. And as you see here, you can have the col the col well the the collodocal cyst, okay? The duplication or exactly the diverticulum. So I, we performed an, an echo endoscopy and endoscopy, and this is what they saw. Any comment? Looks like a collodocal seal, I think. In fact, if you analyze very well the MRI, you see that it is a duodenal duplication. As you know, it's a rare congenital anomaly occurring during embryonic development. And the difference is that uh, you have to prove that there is three, uh, three characteristics. An intimate attachment to the GI tract, a smooth muscle coat and elementary mucosal link. Sure. And this is very rare indeed. And the, uh, the duodenal uh, duplication is one of the duplication you can have in the all digestive tract, but it's very rare, as you see here, uh, less than 6% of the cases. And uh, uh, normally, and that's why we uh, didn't think it was that at the beginning before the, uh, the MRI and the ERCP, uh, it's that 80% uh, uh, of the patient experienced symptoms very early in the life and the patient was 20 years old. And the symptoms here was a pancreatitis, but it can be also a recurrent abdominal pain, angiocolitis, and bleeding. And some malignant transformation has been uh, published. So my question is, what's the treatment? So what do you propose here? I can uh, show you the, the MRI again, but uh, what do you propose? I never observed a case of duodenal duplication. I have less than 100,000 patients, you know. <laughs> one case in Paul Bost. In we fact, have one case in Paul Bost? Uh, Mark, one case in one, Paul Bost? One case in Paul Bost with you. I forgot. I, re I remember. You, you, are, you remember uh, one? We, we, we have done a marsupialization. Well, in fact, uh, uh, there, there are not a lot of cases published in the literature, most of them in the pediatric uh, literature and very, very rarely uh, in adults. Well, uh, we had here a 20-year-old uh, patient and uh, it uh, was not a diverticulum, so uh, the, the, the MRI was quite characteristic of uh, the duodenal uh, duplication. So exactly, yes. in fact, the, the treatment now is either a, a surgical resection, but it's not, uh, it depends on the, the location of uh, the duplication. Here it was uh, in the pancreatal wall of uh, uh, the duodenum, so it was not possible. You can also effectively do a marsupialization Sometimes you have to do a, a Whipple procedure in some cases. That so well, it depends on uh, on the size of uh, the du the duplication. And more recently, endoscopic treatment has been uh, proposed for uh, those duplication. Here you have uh, uh, one a drawing here uh, explaining the the, the uh, what what happens here. You have here the duodenum is like that. 
and here you have the duplication. This is like you have two duodenum. So uh, I performed uh, uh, a duodenotomy, and here you can see that we open the uh, uh, the, the duodenal uh, du um, duplication here, what we call a masculization. But it was quite delicate because here you have the pip the papilla, the and you have here uh, uh, the this oh. tube oh. into the uh, bile duct. So it was really near the papilla. And uh, our endoscopic uh, uh, refused to do this because this can be done by endoscopy uh, because of uh, the proximity of the papilla, which was uh, quite dangerous. So, uh, so usually, the, usually, uh, the, the, uh, this is a beautiful case. Thank you so much. But uh, usually the endoscopists are not afraid of the bile duct. No, but they didn't. Uh, uh, they they couldn't uh, individualize the papilla. So my endoscopic said, "I never did. I, I never performed that because it was so so rare, of course." Mm -hmm. And uh, they they don't like diverticulum, and they hate yeah. duplication. And they hate perforations. Yes. <laughs> and uh, did you do? And I didn't hear you, you did endoscopic ultrasound, right? US. Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, I, I have a question. Yeah, uh, Laurence, the endoscopist, how they, 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 uh, they were sure about the diagnosis of duplication? What was yes. the sign to differentiate uh, diverticulum from It's uh, a question. It's the problem of the wall of uh, the, 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 the structure. Uh, when I you know. have a diverticulum, you have no wall. Uh, exactly. But in case of duplication, it's exactly you have all the wall of the duodenum twice. I know, I know, but how they how they know that uh, during the endoscopy, the ultrasound because of the ultrasound. With, with with the ultrasound, and you can see ah. also uh, in the uh, okay. MRI. I, I showed you again okay. here. Okay. Here, you know, you can see that you have. Uh, I can show you here. Look at that. This is, okay, this is the wall. And uh, the, the okay. funny thing in that, uh, in that uh, observation answer, is the gallstone in the, uh, mm -hmm. the, in the right. duodenal div uh, duplication and not in the gallbladder. That was, 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 was that stones, was it? Was it, stones? it was, it was. A lot of stones, biliary stone, common yeah. biliary stone. I didn't understand exactly why. No good stone why? in the gallbladder, but a lot of stone in the uh, uh, duplication. From stasis. No, no food. No food. No food. Stones. Like what a gallbladder, kind of that's why they, they failed in the diagnosis in, on, on ultrasound. So double, vas <laughs> double gallbladder are really rare. Duplication is extremely rare. Could you, say, could you tell if it was cholesterol stones okay. or... Pigmental stones. It was cholesterol. Cholesterol. Not not black stones. Not at all. Why? Why? I think it was uh, a retention. Uh, something. I think that the bile was uh, was uh, in uh, in this diverticulum, and uh, I think that uh, uh, there there was a, a formation of the stone within the the duplication. Because the there was the bile. Uh, okay. The communication between the two duodenum was large. Not, yeah, not at all. I didn't find uh, it. Not at all. I didn't find it. I think it was a very thin uh, uh, communication uh, between the the, the 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 duplication and the bile. But I'm not okay. sure. How the bile was entering into the second duodenum. Th that is what uh, that is my concern because again I, I, I performed a, a, a radiography and I didn't achieve to uh, uh, to to show this communication. And the papilla was outside. The yes. papilla was outside yes. of this of the duodenum, of the double duodenum. It was in exactly, the exactly exactly. Yeah. And my question also was that uh, she is very young. Uh, I, I performed only. 
uh, mass circulation. So I let uh, some uh, some 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 uh, tissue, and uh, I read that uh, the there was some uh, 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 malignant transformation because there is gastric uh, uh, gastric uh, mucosa. So I hope uh, I I think I had to uh, to control the the, the patient with uh, fibroscopy. Yeah. Uh, uh, Laurence, yeah. Uh, also, I mean, the it's a very interesting case. This double uh, duodenum duplicate, but it reminds me a bit of the physiopathology of the colloidal cyst that happened to the children, and then you mm -hmm. have to, and they have this potential of malignancy later because of the stasis. And you said that you find a lot of stones in the CBD. So my next question for you, when you said that you're going to follow this young girl, how are you going to follow her, uh, your protocol of follow-up? A part of, uh, because I'm not sure that only uh, endoscopy is going to be enough. W what are you going to, f how are you going to follow her? That's, that's a good question and that's why I'm wondering uh, how, uh, there is no recommendation. And uh, I think I, I will do some fibroscopy with lateral view in, in, in order to inspect uh, the, 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 what, I, what I, I've done. So uh, uh, I think that it's like a diverticulum now largely opened in the, in the duodenum. So right. I think I will ask my endoscopy to an um, endoscopist to 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 check uh, uh, the the mucosa within this hole and the CBD also. I think so. Yes. Yeah. The problem, if I, in, when you have to do a follow up young patients, is how long are you going to follow them up, and they uh, th that's eventually, right. eventually, eventually they disappear, and. Yeah. This is not going to happen soon, so she should be. I, I'm sure you informed her that she sh that she has a potential risk. The risk is probably very low. Yeah. You have any idea of the? Of I the, hope so. I hope I, so. I hope so too. But you said there are cases. Is it well documented? No, it is not. It's not uh, the the malignant transformation. Uh, we have two cases reports. And it, it was uh, uh, long ago, so I, I, I didn't find any... Uh, maybe, maybe there were colloidal cysts, you know, and something... Maybe also, yes, <laughs> but uh, these entities are quite, uh, uh, quite uh, close, yes. very close. Oh, very close, very close, yeah. <laughs> because the difference is that, if I may, the, in the, in the colloidal cyst, it's biliary mucosa, and you often there is, a, of, of course, the... the uh, Maljunction with uh, with um, amylase with uh, uh, yes uh, yes with inside. Here you have a duodenal mucosa. If yes, if the real duplication it's different. There will be a a, a digestive uh, cancer, not a biliary cancer. Yes, but uh, some some of us in, in my staff they they discuss a, a Whipple procedure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's not worthy at twenty years old. But uh, no, I, I'm not completely completely. Uh, Pietro wants to, wants to intervene. Pietro. Yes, a, a fascinating case. Um, there are two things. La, the, uh, I never saw one, but surely you must have had a communication because otherwise it makes a closed loop and it bursts. So I think you did not find the communication, but the communication was there. Really, I, I agree with you. I agree because the gallstones were there. <laughs> Okay. But that's why yeah. when you do the endoscopy, uh, Laurence, probably, uh, yes, they will do uh, U.S. I mean, you can follow her up once a year, maybe, but with the full workup with the endoscopy, U.S., and probably brushing of the CBD, because at the early stage, this is what you want to pick up. But okay. Do, do you... Th uh, CBD, well, uh, I think for, for now, this patient has a, a perfect normal papilla. I agree. It's not sphincterotomy. So I think uh, I, I wouldn't do that. Because you said that you found CBD stones, and probably there is a communication. I agree with that. So I'm not convinced that it was completely separate. That, that's my worry. Okay, well, I, I guess we have to close. Any other comments on this uh, fascinating case?
Okay. It's up to you. Okay. You finished now? Huh? Yeah. I Daniel, suppose. you yes. fini? Okay. I, yes, so yes, now yes. We, we go to the last case. Is you, Daniel, to present okay. the last case, I think. Uh, yes. Uh, so who want to be the excitator? Who? Rashad? Gina, Gina, you are so exciting yourself. Rashad, you want I'm to trying to you want Rashad? You want to be the if you leave it to Gina, uh, then she will not comment. Grazie mille, Pietro. Grazie. <laughs> uh, for some reason, Gina, 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 is the best choice. Uh, hold on, please. I need to uh, open my case. I'm trying to uh, share my screen, but uh, for some reason I can't do it. Do you see my slides or not? No. No. Not yet. Okay, hold on. It's Rashad, I ask you a question, Rashad. You don't listen? Your microphone is cut, Rashad. You should activate the microphone, Rashad. Yes. Uh, I have a question for Laurence, if it's yes, not you, late. If want... Is that okay, or are you starting the next yes. case? Oh, go ahead, yeah. go ahead. Go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Laurence. It's a very interesting case, very interesting case. Uh, one question that I don't figure out, uh, when you said duplication of the due genome, were they connected or uh, did you have, for example, to have make a contrast study uh, gastrographin before uh, starting? No. Uh, gastrographin uh, in, the, in, the, in the stomach, you, you, do you know? Yes. Follow, yes. follow. Uh, was one see. with a blind end, for example, the other one connected with a uh, uh, small bowel? No, I don't... no. duplication <laughs> is not connected with the, the lumen, in fact. It was mm. only connected, but I didn't find it, with the biliary mm. tract, probably. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And that's why you have to do the masticularization. Yes. Maybe, maybe you know. Uh, thank you very much. Or, or it's gallstone of the of the duodenum. I don't know. That's mm. that's quite uh, strange as a case. Yeah, yeah. I didn't so find in the literature other cases like that. No, but maybe what what uh, what Pietro said was very important. That if it doesn't, so if there's no exit, then it will explode. So that means that, uh, and you couldn't find any any outlet. So probably one thing is that probably it was very very small and it grew with life and it was filled with bile. I the agree. Bile was the space mm -hmm. bile with stones and when it got big, it created the pancreatitis and then it became symptomatic. Yes, I think so. You're right. But I think yeah. it's a kind of a diverticulum. <laughs> it's a, a diverticulum with very 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 small communication. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay, I don't know if you... Uh, uh, I, do you see my slides? No? I can see. Yes. Yes. Do you see the slides? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. So, uh, this is a benign liver tumor, and uh, there's going to be discussion, I'm sure, about what I've done and not done. Uh, it's a 39-year-old woman referred with presumed benign liver mass. She has no medical history. She has she's two children. She works, and she was she took oral contraceptives for over ten years. So she said she stopped five years ago, and she has an intrauterine device. Uh, she had two episodes uh, of uh, major abdominal pain in June 2020, and it was followed by constant mild pain and discomfort. The ultrasound showed two things: gallbladder stones and an eight centimeter mass in the liver, and the ultrasound uh, the, uh, radiology said probably focal nodal hypoplasia. Then she had an MRI, which uh, the conclusion was not typical for FNH. 
So this is uh, the imaging. So this is a lesion here that you can, can you see my arrow moving? No. I'm using an arrow. Okay, anyway, you can see a mass here. And here uh, is another view from the MRI. And then we uh, repeated the MRI. And this is the MRI that we repeated. And we have a the impression here that we have two uh, nodules, one above here, which is highly hypervascular, and another one below, which is um, less hypervascular. And here on the CT scan, you see here uh, uh, at the arterial phase, this mass with this central defect here and the other mass here. So the, uh, this is the ultrasound that showed that the lesion is 81 millimeters up uh, in one, one side and the and 57 millimeter on the other side and mostly venous uh, branches, which is more in, in favor of adenoma. So uh, our, at, at the MDT, we, we concluded that there were two lesions. One was above the four centimeter FNH at junction of seven and eight. And the, the other one was eight times five centimeters adenoma in segments six and seven. I go back here, so this would be the uh, above, I don't know, you don't see my slot, my arrow, but above would be the uh, FNH and below the adenoma. The cause of pain was unclear whether it was biliary chronic from the uh, stones or the liver masses, and in any case, we decided to biopsy the larger nodule. Um, I, I guess, I, I, should I go all the way, or? Can, can I ask something? Sure. Uh, did you do a, a pathospecific contrast? Yes, this uh, is a before the biopsy contrast. because I. Well, this is a pathospecific specific contrast. This is uh, um, unfortunately you, you may know that or not, but in France we don't have primovist. We uh, we have what we call multiance, which is a uh, manga for DPA. So it's not as good as the primovist that uh, exists uh, in other places. Mm -hmm. Primovist or eovist. Uh, it's not it's not uh, allowed in France. Anyway. Okay. So we did that, and the conclusion was FNH and adenoma. Uh, so we biopsied the, the larger nodule, but and wait, well, yeah. Yes. Uh, why did you biopsy the larger nodule? Because, because we uh, because it wasn't clear uh, whether it was well, it was large in size, but it wasn't. We wanted to make sh to find that we wanted to clear about the pain, and we wanted to find out whether it was. Uh, we wanted to do uh, the uh, immunostaining on the uh, on the adenoma and find out whether it was beta catenin. Uh, because I, I asked this question because it's eight centimeters adenoma, inflammatory adenoma on the mm -hmm. MRI, well, and it's an indication for surgery. That's correct. Anyway, we uh, we were not sure about the, the pain, and if you look at the images. That's, I agree with you. That was a lot of discussion because when you look at the imaging, it's at nine centimeters up, but it's it's kind of small and it's not. It's it's like flat. You see what flat. I mean? No. Anyway, it's, uh, but, but it's inflammatory. You're right. It's an inflammatory adenoma, and that's what the uh, that's what the uh, the biopsy confirmed, and it had all the good markers, etc. So we decided to resect. So probably we could have avoided the biopsy, but this is what we did. So, uh, what kind of operation do you do? Well, let me present the case because it's gonna, and we will discuss at the end. So, I we started, we decided with a laparoscopic case. So, this is my description, uh, uh, and the uh, we could see the, the lesion in segment seven subcapsular kind of diffuse with not really well limited, and was going up to the segment eight above segment six, six in the middle. In the lower, the ultrasound was not very contributive, and the rest of the liver was normal. So I decided to do a rectipatectomy, and maybe there's going to be discussion about that. So it's it was a, a excuse me. It's a little uh, extensive no. surgery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the yeah. What would you do uh, um, by the same way a laparoscopic excision of the yes. of this lesion with a clear margin, in a non, without the rectipatectomy? That's correct. This was another. This was a, a possibility, and we. I think this will be the main, uh, uh, the main discussion, of this case. So it was just. Uh, so I decided because at, the, at laparotomy I couldn't see well at laparoscopy. I mean, I, I couldn't see well the the, the uh, limitations of the, uh, of the, uh, of the tumor. Okay, maybe we can discuss it now. 
And here, this is uh, more in segment. You can see the right hepatic vein, the V8 here. This is mainly in segment eight. This is six and seven. Uh, maybe we can remove only the adenoma and leave the FNH in place. Um, uh, during surgery, I didn't feel comfortable because I couldn't see the margin. So the another way to go would be to open the case and do uh, an excision with or without a margin or to do a right hepatectomy. And this is one of the limitations of laparoscopy that can be discussed. Okay. I, may I add something, Daniel? I have uh, just to add something to your... I understand your point because we have a case of a patient with another normal with the lesions with uh, margins like this where we, in fact, left around, left around two centimeters of adenoma in place that the rig grew, and we had to do a second operation later. Yeah, this is why it's, so, it's very difficult to find the plane, and the, the adenoma tissue looks very much like liver. So it's, uh, it's difficult. Well, that's, that was the reason. But, uh, so uh, I, we don't need to, dis to extend too much on, the, on this, uh, uh, and we'll, we'll discuss later. It was a straightforward case. I'm sorry, but these images are horrible, but that's all I have. So this is the pathology. You can see the FNH here, and you can see the adenoma here. And indeed, it was a big hepatectomy. Of course, this is just a sample, because if you go below, it's a much bigger. And the, the, the images that the pathologist took are not good. Anyway, so she, wa she was OK. We always do a CT scan before we let the patient out of the hospital. This is day five, a CT scan. She's doing very well. This is the drain here. I always drain right hepatectomies. Uh, and uh, because it's difficult to uh, to to puncture collections anyway, and she was discharged the next day. And five days, seven days later, she had acute abdominal pain. She goes to a local hospital. She doesn't work, live in the in the Paris area. Uh, the CT scan showed, as you see here, free fluid uh, below uh, in, in the upper quadrant, and the rest of the abdomen was dry. This is why I showed that. It's very it's localized here because it's seven days. It's it's actually uh, 16 days after surgery. So she, she, uh, they called me, I took her back here, and I, when she arrived, she had a less acute pain, but permanent pain with deep, ins a deep inspiration, and she had a guarding abdomen, in defense. She didn't even feel well. So uh, we decided that we're going to do a percutaneous drainage, and it was pure bile, and this culture was sterile, and the pain immediately subsided after drainage, but the drain started after a couple of days to get to uh, put out 500 millimeters per day, milliliters per day. What do you do? Daniel, I would say this is the right bile duct. Mm. Cholangiogram. Yeah. I agree. So to, for the sake of time, we went to an ERCP and was indeed the hyalur uh, leak of the right bile duct. You can see here the leak. And we put a stent here, and the bile leak dries after two days. But she had abdomin a new abdominal pain, elevated pancreatic enzymes, and she developed pancreatitis. This is a, a, a CT two days after your RCP. She has double pleural effusion. She has here a uh, Balthazar D uh, 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 pancreatitis, the collection here, etc. So clinically significant. First, she was put on diet and uh, on, on, uh, on uh, analgesic, and we waited. She had not, didn't have any signs of, of uh, severity. And so she stayed uh, for 22 days on the second uh, hospital stay. And eventually, we removed the stent only uh, two months later, uh, on uh, January 2021. And now she uh, <laughs> hopefully completely recovered. So I wanted to find out what, was, what happened. And I had the video, I, vi I record all my, and I looked at the bile duct, the management of the bile duct. So this is the operation, it's very brief. So usually I put a tape around the, uh, the, the, the pelvic artery and portal vein I, did, I divided, and this is a tape, it's a little uh, fast forward, the tape, and I wasn't sure about where, where was the hyler, so I decided uh, I wasn't comfortable, usually I use a stapler here. So, but I, I thought that I, I thought we were too close for the confluence, and I decided I would just sharply cut the bile duct, like we would do in a living donor, for example. So I cut the bile duct here. Here is the bile duct. You can see a second duct in the back. So we completely cut the bile duct.
a little hesitant because this is a really a, it's not the easiest part of the operation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's too long. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. So, and then we finish the hyaluronic plate with the energy device because it can bleed. I show you everything. Then we finish the transaction and this is the end now we have the open bile duct and we could suture it or whatever so uh, but i decided i would clip it because i didn't want any lip puncture but i just put this stitch to expose and i put a clip here i didn't want to put a hemolock because I, I, I thought i was very close from uh, the confluence and this is the end looks good you can see it here so what i want to show you i, I, I need to go so this is a the usual way I deal with the bile duct. This is another case. And usually we just staple the bile duct and the hyaluronic plate together. And with this technique, we never had any problem. And the next case, and, and another way to go would be this. This is the bile duct, this is a living donor and we clip and then cut. But I know exactly where the, the confluence here is. Well, exactly maybe is too big a word. And here we cut on the other side. So these are the three ways to go. Uh, and then you, the, the rest of the hyaluronic plate is, is taken with a clip. So I think the, the bile duct uh, in laparoscopic right hepatectomy is a uh, thing. So the discussion, number one, did she require surgery? Number two, what is the right operation? Was this the right operation or was it too much? Uh, number three, comments on bile duct closure during laparoscopic right hepatectomy. And number four, management of bile leak after liver resection. Laurence. <laughs> Pietro? <laughs> Laurence, euh, euh, et il n'y a pas un, un quatrième système que tu aurais pu utiliser pour cette patiente. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, a fourth system that you would have like, might use that, that separates the two pedicles of the uh, posterior and anterior sector, because you had no need to go that far on the high room on the left. I mean, that I thought was very dangerous. And I just sent you uh, uh, um, to all of you on the WhatsApp, a, a videotape on, uh, on a posterior sectorectomy. This is what we would have done for this patient and not a right hepatectomy. Because yeah. in fact, the, the most of the, of the borders you can see, and you, I, I, I really would like your comments on that operation that you will see. The other thing is, do you do a check with, uh, now we do it uh, with uh, lipid solution of the uh, bile duct closure once uh, you've done the protector. Um, okay. May I have a remark? Uh, you know, uh, why, why you, you do the ligation of the right by duct on the main branch? Usually, I always recommend to do on the secondary branch, branch on the sectorial branch, never on the main. This this is close to uh, this is close to uh, Pietro's comment. So you have to you can of course uh, do the right hepatectomy without hyalur dissection. Means like the Asians do. You you do a Pringle or not? And you open the liver and then you staple separately the, the, the totatung. and this is totatung, totatung yeah. technique. Mm -hmm. Agree. That's, that's to go inside the liver to to. to to uh, ligate the biliary branch. Oh, so you can argue. That's, that's good. And uh, so that's not the way I do right hepatectomy. I do a hyalur dissection. I devascularize the right liver. And then I see the ischemic margin, which you cannot, or 
which you cannot do if you don't dissect them, or you could do a Gleasonian approach and clamp, that's correct. Yes. But uh, if you look at the video from the, the, the Asians, they clamp the porta hepatis, they do a Pringle, and then they open the liver. But anyway, uh, uh, that's the way I do it. And then I go in the hilum and take the baldat far to the right. And if you saw here, it was rather to the right. And I, actually, I had two ducts. If yes. I showed you there were two ducts. Yeah. And so I, yeah. I saw your, your video. In fact, uh, you, you, you did very well. The, you saw exactly the bile duct and you put a clip on it. It, it seemed to be perfect. So uh, it was perfect at the end. So uh, obviously the clip fold hmm? fell, fell, excuse me, fell. Uh, so it's, uh, well, it's quite frightening because I do the same. I never uh, do, put the, a stapler and uh, I, I'm afraid uh, of a stapler on the bile duct, so I close with a clip or with a ligation, and exactly like you. So uh, if I can comment uh, on your uh, discussion points, uh, did she require surgery? Certainly. Uh, was it the right operation? Uh, I guess it was not, because uh, uh, it was easier on laparoscopy. And uh, for me, um, it's uh, it's uh, uh, obviously uh, that you 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 performed a, a minimal invasive surgery with which became a very invasive uh, uh, surgery because she experimented uh, uh, bile duct leak and pancreatitis all with uh, non-invasive procedures. Uh, anyway, it is quite difficult to do a, 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 a sectorial uh, epitectomy on. Uh, uh, on laparoscopy because no no no, no, no. You can, no it's it's uh, to go to Pietro Pietro I do yes. regularly I, I do many anterior and posterior sectorectomies in this case and I can sh send you the videos as well I do this in cirrhotic patients so uh, it's just that here I was I was I wanted to remove both lesions because it wasn't clear about both lesions and the the, the FNH was in segment eight so it was. I agree with you that it's a big operation, and I showed you the pathology report, the pathology slides. So, uh, and uh, it's just to show that uh, uh, I think we, it's good to show complications. And anyway, I think what happened here is that the clipping was not what done well, and probably put two clips or put a or put a hemolock, a hemolock. Clip or a hemolock. The problem with the hemolock is that it's a little thick and it's difficult to remove. So once you place the hemolock, difficult to remove. So this is something, this is to show, number one, I agree with you and I always said, don't change the indication because you do laparoscopy, and this was not the case. But on the other hand, I think when you have a 39-year-old woman and she wants laparoscopy, yeah. it's all right. Okay? Of course, yes. Uh, and uh, so this is, this is uh, the gray zone of uh, Yes, it is. Mm. Just, just a comment. Uh, yeah. Uh, I would say... Um, for example, in right hepatectomy, we also close with a hemolock or with a stapler, and it usually goes very well. In this operation, in fact, I would manage the bile leak the same way, but I would probably choose uh, a right posterior laparoscopic sectionectomy and just to remove the adenoma in a plane that I was sure that was all included there. That was the only thing. I could, I, 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 will, I could never be, uh, I was, intraoperatively, I was not sure of the plan. Me, I have a comment mostly about the management of the bile leak, if I may uh, comment on that. Uh, before, before giving the comment, Danielle, could you let me know, after she was readmitted in the hospital because of the bile leak, including the time of the post-TRCP pancreatitis, how long did she stay? in the hospital 22 days 22 days so my only question is why did you uh, want to put the stent to treat this by leak instead of simply <laughs> drainage and wait because when we drain the, that's what we started to, we always do that yeah when you have or a by leak you put you put a drain and mm -hmm. you and the drain was putting out for six days 500 millimeter milliliters okay. So it was a high flow uh, yeah. fistula that wouldn't close. Okay, so, so it was the ERCP stent, and the stent closed the fistula, except at the expense of a pancreatitis. Yeah, pa pancreatitis post ERCP. Okay. 
No, it's just that there's no benign complication. No. Especially in benign disease. Now, my second question for everybody. Uh, would you still go on doing, uh, if, if a same patient come back again with the same type of lesion in the young woman, would you go still for a right hepatectomy or would you do a right uh, posterior hepatectomy? Me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you have to make decisions sometimes. And uh, I am a parenchymal sparing surgeon like we are all. And I felt that during the operation, that was the right thing to do. That's my, that was my decision. Okay. So uh, I just keep in mind I, what I, my feeling here. She, she, the main the main thing I I, I I think I did wrong here was badly closing the bile duct. Uh, Daniel, Daniel, may I ask you something? I am a, a little in trouble. I have the feeling that it could be wrong that by open surgery, it could have been easier to do uh, enucleation. That means to remove only the adenoma. On the opposite, by laparoscopy, uh, it's easier to do right hepatectomy as you perform. That means you have in balance to do, uh, I may say, easier operation by laparoscopy. And what is the advantage to do uh, a larger operation by laparoscopy than a more difficult operation by uh, uh, laparotomy. Do you understand what I mean? Very well. Um, uh, and I wrote that in several editorials or uh, when when I'm asked to speak about laparoscopy. I am sorry. I am sorry. No, not no, 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 no. That's not, I'm not saying that you should have read it. I'm just saying that <coughs> I'm not very comfortable with that question because this is a real, this is a, of, of course, the question is, uh, and I always say that you shouldn't do a, a bigger hepatectomy because it's easier. And if it's, if you have to do open, just do open. It's just that here, uh, I, I thought I could do a smaller operation and during surgery, I was not able to find the right answer to that in this patient. I was afraid, and, and Hugo told us that one time he removed only part of the adenoma, not all yes. adenoma. I had was afraid of that. And so I decided that, number one. Number two, uh, the question is, uh, she had a normal liver. She had a, you, a very nice left liver that was plenty enough for her. And she... Has no, uh, and she didn't have a laparotomy. So the question at the end of the day in, in a young woman with benign disease uh, is uh, you can have bile leaks also by open surgery mm -hmm. and posterior sectionectomies, you also, uh, sectorectomies, whatever you want to call it, there are also uh, bile leaks and maybe more. So I think at the end of the day, it's uh, individual discussion with the patient. And she was very, very keen on laparoscopy. <laughs> I, but you know, Daniel, I, I, I won't. I won't discuss. Uh, I respect your choice, of course, uh, uh, with this patient. Uh, I know that uh, for adenoma, and particularly uh, this type of adenoma, uh, the 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 limits are really difficult, even in laparotomy. Yeah. And uh, what oh. uh, can be done okay. for that is to put a marker. Be before the surgery by the radiologists and uh, it can help to uh, respect the limits. Uh, I've done that once uh, uh, and it was helpful because you can see on ultrasonography the marker and you can uh, better see the limits of uh, the, the, the lesion and the adenoma like that because it's very it's difficult. A, Even that's, in a lot of, that's a lot of work to preserve a few if you yes, do it, is. it is. Just, just to tease you. <laughs> Another option, uh, Pietro. Pietro, yes, yes. Um, I, I think uh, you may get out of it by doing the ultrasound before the operation, especially in he a woman it. who's not. Huh? I'm sure he because does it. If you don't see it, well, but if you don't see the limits before the operation, and I think the idea of Florence for putting markers is very good indeed. Another option is 
to use in the sign in green. This is most helpful when you do robotics. But Not I don't know. I don't know. I, I, in the video I sent you, there is a very nice in the sign in green, but I don't know how in the sign in green color differently in adenomas. And honestly, I don't know. It, it should it should not color because uh, if you inject it, uh, for example, uh, intraoperatively, you only see the ischemia. But if you inject around 12 hours earlier, you can see the fact that there's a difference in bile expression, which adenomas usually don't have. That's correct. So should I, 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 I do I, I know, is inject yeah. it one week before. Do you know it is it will stay in the adenoma and out of the rest of the liver. Do you know it is possible yeah, to, clever, do yeah. to do embolization, to do embolization of the adenoma? The adenoma is hypervascular. That means when you do uh, embolization, I speak arterial embolization, you have a very nice limit, a very nice limit of the adenoma. So I have a suggestion only, why not to do embolization before surgery, and then you have a clear limit for after seven days or two weeks, you have a change of color of the adenoma. I say that for I have the feeling that, you know, to do a right hepatectomy for a segment seven lesion, I am in trouble for that. I have the feeling that it is a right hepatectomy by comfort, by comfort of the surgeon. But by comfort of the patients. Me too. I, I don't like the comfort of the surgeon. In the, <laughs> comfort, of the surgeon. the comfort of the patient, you know, is to so, look here. This is the comfort of the patient. What do you think? Ah, stop it. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. That's not true. That's not true. Yes, of course it's true. No. no. Did you have a <laughs> Did you have a If you do the same operation, but I agree, but you change the dimension. You change the dimension yes. for a benign tumor. But of course, I agree. This, this is this why my first question. That means the comfort of the patient, the comfort of the surgeon, the, the, the small incision, the large incision. So uh, let me ask a question. Suppose that your patient has uh, hepatocellular carcinoma of the left lobe of the liver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, know. I was waiting, I was waiting for the or, in 20 years. Or, or liver metastasis from the colorectal cancer. Or liver metastasis. Exactly, exactly. Oh, my you poor will, Daniel, you're you a criminal. Will, will, I was waiting. I think it took too long to come, this question. Yes. <laughs> you were waiting for that. Well, in the, you know, in 20 years, we'll have the, tree, the cure of cancer. No problem. And, Daniel, and can I have a question? ask you a question? Yeah, Mr. Batur. Yeah. Could you have uh, closed that stump of the bile duct by future? Sure. Do it any time? Sure, I should have done that. Will, will that be safer than using the, the problem, yeah. problem that I, 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 I prefer, it's good yeah. to stitch, but the stitch, uh, you have needle holes. And yeah. anyway, I like a clip, personally. But, uh, uh, but you could say that, uh, and anyway, you could do that. Yes, the answer is yes. No, I know that. Daniel, uh, can you stop? Daniel, and we can take time than applying the clip. Pietro, yeah, 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 no, I wanted. It's, it's, it's such a pleasure to. Yeah, it's such a pleasure to see you all. If you can stop the uh, sharing of the screen, we have a much bigger uh, gallery of people. Sure. Okay. okay. Thank you. Then, yeah. Thank you, Pietro. But uh, why then, we are only nine? Uh, Jean why we are only nine? Normally, you you know, we are more people outside. Eight people outside. Yes. is outside. The best, and, uh, the best are, are out of the nine. Yes. <laughs> Not really. No, but, not really. But, please, but we, 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 what you can do, yeah, what you can Daniel, do, Remove, yes. remove me from the screen. Let other people come. <laughs> Daniel? Manuel Jacques, need to come here. Remove me. <laughs> yes, I'm here for I, I have one question for the last case. 
Uh, does anybody have any experience here with uh, near infrared guided resection for these types of tumors? Yeah, we, we mentioned that. ICG, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, that would be, I think that, uh, no, there. No, just, just a naive question because uh, you, as usually, are very impressed by the skill, the technical skill, but for a presum presumably uh, benign disease, why you don't dissect more on the right to cut the sub-segment 5, 8 and uh, 6, 7 separately? And probably you, you limit the risk of, uh, of biliary fistula. Sometimes when, when we do right hepatectomy, we dissect um, easily on the right to uh, separately uh, cut the, the two. Uh, uh, this, this has been mentioned before that the hepatectomy was too much for this patient, and I agree with that. Uh, I'm not sure that going more distal reduces the risk of bile leak. And to be honest, this is, the, this is a very uncommon situation. Uh, my experience with laparoscopic right is starts to be rather big, and is the first uh, by leak of that magnitude. I, did, I think I did. I just did manage it wrong. I, I didn't close the ball that well. Okay. But I agree that at the end of the day, it's all about uh, uh, too big an operation, maybe. Good point. Okay. No other comment. No other comment. So uh, yes, we have I, I might, what, 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 what I would like to suggest um, to suggest for the next time that uh, we keep a, a room free or two room free since the beginning to let people coming when they want to discuss. Well, I think we 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 block the screen. Pietro, you have you have to suggest. Oh, yeah. uh, there is there is a. Uh, three dots on your right, uh, which allow you to do the, uh, with the presets, and there is a, a layout, and then on the second, yes, it is yes, a layout, yes. you can decide how many people, little squares you have, how many windows. And on mine, it says that I can have up to 49. So, for instance, I think that now, Valerio, if he turned, and Marcello, if they turn on their camera, we would see them. I don't know whether there are people outside that we can't see. You see? But, uh, on, my screen, on, on my screen, I see uh, nine people. Uh, no, on but my, you can adjust mine, it. I, uh, it yes, works now, This yeah. is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. I'm, I think I see everybody who wants to be seen. Yeah. Ah. Uh, okay, I don't know to do that. Uh, we, we, we can have a private session, and I will show you. Okay. N next time, next time we will have that. Uh, we will ask Marcelo to give recommendation to prepare mm, to have more people on the screen, the maximum people on the screen. Okay, I think we, we finished. Thank you. Thank you a lot, and be prepared for the next. We have already the date of the next. And I remind you, my mail uh, that I sent to you, about the evolution of our websites in order to increase uh, the, the number of people coming to, to see us. I think the group of compagnons is becoming stronger and stronger, uh, and uh, we need to speak among us. Please use WhatsApp or mail to exchange during the following week on my proposal. I send you a mail to you, a long mail. I agree, it is very long. It, it was uh, in the beginning of January, I think. Please look at it and uh, exchange with me and with all the other. It is what I call the evolution of the group of the compagnons uh, to, to be uh, stronger and stronger. I think all of you uh, like this idea. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your presence. And thank all you. of you, uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you for. Goodbye. Bye bye. Ah, bah voilà. Ah, bah voilà, on voit tout le monde maintenant.
Oui, mais je fais une insiste. <rire> mais en fait... <rire> Vas-y, on peut, on peut enfin discuter. <rire> bon, -moi, Donc, on peut parler français. Mais comment ça va, Jean-Robert était à en retard, mon vieux Mais oui, mais j'avais un rendez-vous à 14h, ouais. alors je suis arrivé hyper en retard. Je 